Hello and welcome. My name is Nathan and I'm here to discuss the emergence of benzimidazole opioids like isotonidazine. Today we'll look at when these opioids appeared, where they came from, why they're a threat, and we'll look at some of the current trends surrounding these opioids. We'll also look at some of the analytical data associated with these opioids. Cayman's Forensic Catalog currently offers a variety of standards for drug chemistry and toxicology labs, as well as for opioid research. Cayman Chemical is located in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I am a scientist in our Forensic Chemistry R&D group. My primary focus is the synthesis of opioid reference materials, and I also help Cayman stay ahead of drug trends by monitoring the internet. Cayman offers forensic reference standards and certified reference materials, and our catalog includes a wide range of classes, as well as labeled internal standards and metabolites. Our ISO QC lab is accredited under ISO 17025 and ISO 17034. As we focus on isodonitazine and related analogs today, compounds that we sometimes call nitazines, I want to start by looking at their structures and answering the question, what are nitazines? Etonitazine is one such structure, shown here, and it is comprised in part of a benzimidazole core, shown here in blue, and these compounds are also known as benzimidazole opioids. Nitazines in particular are characterized by having a nitro substituent in the 5 position on the benzimidazole ring. They also have two characteristic chains that come off of that benzimidazole core in the 1 and 2 positions. One of those is the benzyl moiety, shown here, and the other is the diethyl amino ethyl chain, shown here. As the result of drug code 9850, we're seeing fewer and fewer fentalogs, but other classes of opioids have arisen in their place. Some of these opioids include AP237, brorphine, and other analogs of U47700. These opioids, while new to the scene, are being regularly discussed on Reddit and are also appearing on sites that sell directly to users. Until recently, nitazines have remained largely unidentified in forensic casework. In Germany in the late 1980s, an illicit lab manufacturing adonitazine was discovered, and in Moscow in the 90s, adonitazine was being sold illegally. Most recently, adonitazine was found in the United States in Utah in 2003. There, a clandestine chemist was producing small quantities of adonitazine for their personal use. The news article covering the story at the time briefly discussed the dangers of adonidazine, and while the case certainly wasn't a trend then, it was another hint that these opioids may continue to resurface. That news article concluded with the above statement, because the drug is difficult to make and so potent, Reuter doubts this latest discovery is the start of any type of trend. As it turns out, that was not to be the case. As we know now, that 2003 incident may have been the beginning of the trend we see today. Isodonitazine surfaced online in October of 2018 and continued to emerge throughout early 2019. It is implicated in three death cases in Canada, and these are the earliest reported fatalities associated with it. Isodonitazine was first reported in the U.S. in August of 2019 by the CFSRE, the Center for Forensic Science Research and Education. I have also included a snapshot of their first quarter 2020 report on MPS opioid positivity, where you can see that isodonitazine makes up a significant portion of both toxicology and seized drug samples in comparison to other opioids. Isodonitazine was reported on in a 2019 publication in Drug Testing and Analysis. A group from Belgium reported on the chemical and in vitro characterization of isodonitazine. In 2020, the EMCDDA, the European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addiction, also released a report on isodonitazine. This report covered the regulation, reporting, seizures, and analysis of isodonitazine, and it mentions that seizures in various countries totaled 109.6 grams of powder and 4.5 grams in liquid form between April 2019 and January of 2020. We have already discussed nitazine analogs, etonitazine, and isodonitazine, but there are a variety of other known analogs that are reported on as well. 
Etonitazine here on the left is characterized by its five position nitro group, the diethyl amino ethyl portion, and the ethoxy benzyl fragment shown here. This compound is a Schedule I controlled substance, and it has been listed for sale on the dark web market, the Wall Street market, as well as on direct to user websites. Data reports that etonidazine has a 2,500-fold greater binding affinity at the mu opioid receptor when compared to morphine in animal models. Another nidazine analog shown on the right, clonidazine, differs only by its substitution in the pair position on the benzyl ring, highlighted here with the chlorine atom. This compound is also a Schedule I controlled substance, and to our knowledge has not yet appeared on dark web markets or direct to user websites. We also have not identified any Reddit forums discussing this compound, although some websites claiming to sell metonidazine, which we'll see next, actually show the structure of clonidazine, which is below. Clonidazine was studied in human clinical trials and showed no apparent tolerance after a 35-day trial, but has not seen additional clinical studies that we know of. Other nidazine analogs that have become more prevalent as users seek alternatives to fentanyl include metonidazine and flunidazine. Metonidazine differs from etonidazine and isotonidazine in that it has a methoxy group in this position here. Metonidazine continues to be sold on both surface and on dark web markets and continues to see chatter on Reddit throughout 2020. Flunidazine is structurally related to clonidazine, but it has a fluorine in place of the chlorine in this position here. Despite being sold on various websites, the Reddit chatter has dropped off dramatically in late 2020 as users have been disappointed with the potency of this analog. Next we'll look at benzimidazole analogs that are lacking the nitro group in the 5 position. These compounds are missing the nitro group and are referred to as desnitazines. One such analog is etodesnitazine and was discussed beginning in June of 2019 on Reddit. In spring of 2020, Reddit continued to discuss this analog, and it continued to be sold online as both neat materials and in solution, and it is known by several names, including etazine and etazone. Another similar analog to it, metodesnitazine, has the methoxy group in this position instead of the ethoxy group. In late 2019 and early 2020, Reddit continued to discuss this analog, and in April of 2020, we identified it on direct-to-user websites for sale. Trip reports on Reddit, as well as discussions, continue throughout 2020. Our connections with toxicology labs and drug chemistry labs have led us to hear no reports yet of this analog appearing in their work. So why are these nidazines emerging, and what do we know about their potency? A look at the literature shows that these compounds were first reported on in 1957, and studies in animal models indicated that etonidazine had a thousand-fold greater activity versus morphine at the mu opioid receptor. We can see here in rows D and E that even the desnitro compounds, without the nitro group in the 5 position, exhibit significant activity relative to morphine. Ultimately, we see that the 5-nitro group and the 4-alkoxy group impart significant activity of these opioids at the mu opioid receptor, and analogs like isotonidazine and metonidazine are hundreds-fold higher than that of morphine. The drug testing and analysis report that I mentioned earlier covers the pharmacology of isotonidazine and includes this nice illustration. It shows that the activity of isotonidazine at the mu opioid receptor is even higher than that of fentanyl. Kamen has been working with these researchers to expand on what's known about nidazine pharmacology. This collaboration with Ghent University in Belgium was published in March in ACS Chemical Neuroscience. It provides data on the mu opioid receptor activity of a variety of nidazine analogs and includes information on some of the metabolites as well. This paper also covers generic synthetic routes and chemical characterization of each analog. I'd like to focus on two key points from this research. First, shown here is a beta arrestin recruitment assay comparing isotonidazine with fentanyl, morphine, and hydromorphone. Beta arrestin recruitment is associated with greater respiratory depression, 
isodronidazine tops fentanyl in this assay, showing that it's potentially dangerous to users. Additionally, this research shows that one particular metabolite, N-desethyl isodronidazine, exhibits strong beta arrestin recruitment on par with that of etonidazine, long believed to be the most potent analog. Aside from their potency, another draw for illicit manufacturers is the relative ease of synthesis of nidazine analogs. The general scheme shown below here is recreated from what's known in the literature and is used to illustrate that there's significant diversity possible with minimal changes. Depending on the substituents used in the first step and in the last step, there are a large number of possible analogs that can be created in this drug class. Because this new class of synthetic opioids continues to emerge, I want to spend some time looking at the GCEI mass spectral data for isodronidazine and its related analogs. You can see here that the base peak of 86 is the most significant, and it's generated by the diethyl amino ethyl group. The next most prominent ion, 107, is generated by the parahydroxybenzyl fragment. Unfortunately, there's very limited information otherwise, with other small ions being generated by the benzimidazole core, and these are not particularly telling of what analog you might have. Unfortunately, the 107 ion with the parahydroxybenzyl fragment may also be generated by metonidazine, etonidazine, and other alkoxy substituted nidazines. It's important to note that protonidazine and its corresponding EI mass spec looks almost identical to isodonidazine. The spectrum of metonidazine is very similar to that of isodonidazine, but it does have the unique 121 ion, which is generated by the paramethoxybenzyl fragment shown here. It still contains the base peak 86 generated by the diethylamine fragment, but otherwise is limited in the information that it provides. As we'll see with the next analogs, though, there are still characteristic ions that appear in the GC spectra of these compounds. Flunidazine, with its fluorine in place of an alkoxy group in the para position, has a characteristic 109 ion shown here and it makes it easier to differentiate this analog among other nidazines. It's important to note, however, that this 109 ion can also appear in other classes, such as synthetic cannabinoids containing the parafluorobenzyl group. The desnidazines offer a bit more information when it comes to the EI mass spec. They still contain the base peak 86 fragment, but as you can see with etodesnidazine, it now has a more characteristic and diagnostic 135 peak generated by the paraethoxybenzyl fragment. Desnidazines also show a characteristic molecular ion represented here at 351. The same is true for metodesnidazine, with its characteristic 121 fragment generated by the paramethoxybenzyl group and its characteristic parent molecular ion shown here at 337. Let's also look at what's known about the metabolism of isodonidazine. Researchers at the CFSRE study the metabolites that form in vivo as the results of isodonidazine abuse. In their authentic samples, they identified metabolite M1, the N-desethyl isodonidazine, and metabolite M3, the N-desethyl O-desalkyl isodonidazine, as the predominant biomarkers of isodonidazine abuse. They also noted that the reduction product, 5-amino isodonidazine, shown here, was much less common, and minor metabolite M2 is actually suspected to be a common metabolite of metonidazine and etonidazine. Since I've spent time looking at the EI mass spec of nidazines, I also want to highlight a few key points that are known about the LCMS analysis of nidazines, since it's used heavily in toxicology. A 2020 publication in the Journal of Analytical Toxicology shows that the base peak of 100, as well as the smaller ion, 72, are both generated by the diethyl amino ethyl group. We also see a small 107 mass to charge fragment generated by the parahydroxybenzyl fragment shown here. 
The 2019 drug testing and analysis publication characterized isodonidazine using a variety of methods, and it reported the UV spectrum to have a lambda max of 238 and 305, which could serve as a quick indicator if your unknown could possibly be isodonidazine. I've also included the proposed fragmentation pathway here from a publication in 2016 from the International Journal of Mass Spectrometry because some of the ions shown here might be helpful for analyses using LCMS-MS. Some of these ions are consistent with those found in the EI mass spectrum, like the 107, the 135, and the 296 ions. Before we conclude, I want to offer an opinion about where this class of compounds might be headed. There are obviously many areas on this scaffold that can be tweaked to come up with new structures. We've already discussed changes can be made to both the R1 and the R2 groups to impart diversity. The position alpha to the carbonyl, R3, is another such position. You can also imagine that a variety of amines can be used in the first step to give us a large number of possible structures. I also want to point out that these substitutions, particularly those here, alpha to the carbonyl, aren't just possible synthetically. The literature actually shows that the compounds of this type give analogs with potency that's on par to the nitazines we've already seen here so far. With little known about nitazines, and with limited studies on their structure activity relationships, we do know that the five position nitro group and the benzyl para position are important for activity. Changes to the diethylamino ethyl group may also enhance that activity. These analogs shown here, with the acetamido group in the benzylic position, have activities that are several fold higher than morphine and might be worth looking out for. Recently, we've discovered other alkoxy analogs being sold to users on the internet. One of these is protonidazine with the para propoxy group and butonidazine with the para butoxy group. The newest analog we've come across on direct-to-user websites is etonitazepine. Structurally very similar to etonidazine, it contains the five-position nitro group and the ethoxybenzyl group, but it differs in that it has the ethyl chain instead of the diethylaminoethyl chain. Ultimately, I don't think we've seen an end to the analogs that clandestine labs will produce. As we conclude our look ahead, I'd like to highlight a recent review in ACS Chemical Neuroscience that was published the same day as our nitazine pharmacology paper. It captures a lot of what's known about benzimidazole opioids, and it includes literature potency data on many analogs. One such analog, closely related to etonitazepine, shown here with a piperidine substitution, has potency 100 times that of morphine in animal models. This one might be worth looking out for, as well as analogs with an alkyl group substitution in place of this alkoxy group at the benzyl 4 position. These analogs have also been shown to have potencies several fold higher than that of morphine. Overall, this review serves as a great resource for anyone looking to learn more about nitazine history, synthesis, and pharmacology. I hope all of this has made clear the emerging threat that benzimidazole opioids continue to pose and has provided you some analytical tools to help continue the fight against them. Thank you for your time and attention.